Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to pray. If you're able to stand, would you uh, go before the Lord in reverence and in honor and stand? Father God, we come before you in this place, Lord, and we're just grateful that we have the opportunity to come into the house of the Lord to hear from you. God, we don't come into this place to hear from a man, to hear from a woman, to hear from a band, but God, we come into this place to hear from you. Lord, we fully acknowledge Jesus Christ as a senior leader of this church, and we ask that you would open our eyes to see, Father, and our ears to hear the word that you would bring to us tonight, Father. We thank you that you would just impart your seed, Father, that it would, your seed of your word, Lord, and that it would, that it would fall on good ground, Lord. We thank you that as we leave this place, Father, we would be impacted, Lord, we would be equipped, we would be uh, uh, ready to serve in the ministry, Father, to be full-time ministers of the gospel to each and every one of our circles of influence. And Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. We thank you for the move of, the, of God that you're pouring out upon the Inland Empire, Father. We thank you for the change in lives that we see each and every day. And we truly shout it out in Jesus' mighty name. We, we all said? Amen. 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 Well, I'll tell you what, I'm excited because we're going to start a series over the next uh, four weeks um, on Sunday nights. The title of the series is called Love God, Love People. Love God, Love People. You're like, oh man, Pastor Luke, that sounds great the first half. <laughs> the second half, I'm not quite sure about that one, but... You know what? I'll tell you what. It's going to be great. We're going to, I, I truly believe it's going to be eye-opening. I, I truly believe because I was just studying for it today. Pastor Dan started, and I started talking about the, the content of the messages and the content of the series. And I just truly believe that it's in season and that it's just something that you and I, each and every one of us, doesn't matter where we are, doesn't matter where we are in our walks with God, need to hear, need to be reminded, need to understand the concept of loving God and loving people. So what we're going to do is over the next two weeks, we're going to focus on the first half of loving God. After that, the second two weeks, we're going to focus on the, the second half of loving people. So what we're going to do today is I want to kind of bring the introduction to the message, bring the introduction to the series. So if you guys have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of Matthew? If you've got your Bibles, you should always bring your Bibles. I mean, if you can't bring your Bible to church... How are you going to know the Word of God anywhere else in life? So always remember to bring your Bible. It is the, the sword of the Spirit. It is your sustenance. And not everything, Pastor Luke, I always make it a point. My video director always asks me afterwards, should I put that on the screen? I say, no. We only, I only put some of the things I put up on the screen because I want to make it a point for you to get your Bible. Write it down because don't listen. Don't just take what we say up here. For what it is. It's your responsibility to go and to study it, to digest it, to hear it, to, to think about it, to meditate it, to grab a hold of the Word of God. Hey, it's not my job. It's, I'm up here to teach you where to preach the Word of God to you, but it's your job to learn it. It's your job to get it in, and you do that by bringing your Bible. You do that by getting into the Word of the Lord. So, as we uh, turn into Matthew, the 22nd chapter, I don't know if I told you 22nd chapter, here we see Jesus Christ. We're going to look towards the second half of the chapter, towards the end of the chapter, and Jesus Christ is... Um, has been challenged. And basically what happens is, is um, as, as to give you a little bit of background here, Jesus Christ has essentially silenced the Sadducees. The Sadducees were uh, a group of, of Jews, uh, a certain branch of, uh, of the Jewish religion. They were kind of the elitist. They were kind of like the aristocracy of the, of the Jewish people. They were the royalty type, uh, the, the, the pure bloodlines. They were very legalistic in their nature. They were very focused on the law and on the writings of the law. And so they, they had come and they were challenging Jesus. And Jesus had responded to each and every one of their challenges. And basically, he shut them up. They, they had no more argument. They had nothing else left to say. So now the Bible tells us, that as we pick up in the, in the tail end of the 22nd chapter of Matthew, that the Pharisees have heard that Jesus has silenced the Sadducees. Now, the Pharisees were yet another group of, of Jews, another, another branch of the Jewish religion. This is kind of like more of your blue-collar uh, group. These were the middle classes where most Jews fell. And, you know, the, Saris, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they didn't really get along very much together just because of the differences in their theology and the differences in their beliefs and so forth and so on. So the Bible tells us in Matthew, the 22nd chapter, that the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, so they come and they start to question Jesus. Now, they're not questioning Jesus because 
uh, he silenced the Sadducees, and he, they're interested in what Jesus had to say. They're not saying, wow, look at this guy. This guy is so full of the knowledge of God. This guy is so full of the word of God that we want to know what he has to say. What does he have to say? But rather, they're coming, and they're trying. The Bible says that they try to test Jesus by asking him questions. Why? So that they can prove themselves to be above. They can try to stump Jesus. They can try to, 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 say what, to, to argue what he says so that people around would say, hey, look at these guys. These are the guys that stumped the guy that stumped the Sadducees. We're the top dogs. And so the Bible tells us that. It makes it a, it makes it a point to let us know that the Pharisees, the, the lawyers, the ones that, the lawyers, they were the ones that focused on the law and different things. They came to Jesus in Matthew, the 26th chapter, after hearing that he had silenced the Sadducees and they gathered together. In verse number 35, we pick up, says to them, one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question testing him. Now see, they asked Jesus a question, testing him. Why? They didn't want to know the answer to the question that we're going to get to and we're in the, the topic of our, of our series. They weren't asking him to see what is the uh, response. Does G they weren't asking him to see his knowledge of the word of God because it was clear based on Jesus silencing the Sadducees that he knew what the, what the word of God said. Rather, what they were doing is they were trying to test his judgment. You see, the Pharisees, they were very legalistic in their nature. So what they were doing is they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, verse number 36, what is the great, which is the great commandment in the law? This is a very simple, this is a very basic question for a Jew to ask a Jew, especially a lawyer or a person dedicated to, to the, studying the word of God to, from a teacher to a teacher. This is like Christianity or Judaism 101. The thing is, though, is based on the Pharisees and based on their religion and based on their beliefs over, over hundreds of years of, of living in captivity, of going through and building the temple, of seeing the different kings and the different um, the, the, the shifts in time and things of that nature, the, their beliefs on what the greatest commandment wasn't all unified. Some people believed that the greatest commandment was to honor the Sabbath. Other people believed that the greatest commandment was to be circumcised as a Jew. Yet other people believed that the greatest commandment above all other commandments was to, to give sacrifice unto God. So they weren't testing his answer to say, oh, okay, you got it. It was a multiple choice question and Jesus, you got it. But rather what they were doing is they were trying to test his judgment. And Jesus' answer from a simple question gives rather a simple and direct answer back. But then he drops a bomb on the tail end of his statement, which we're going to read in just a moment. So them testing Jesus, they say, Jesus, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Verse number 37, Jesus says to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And here's that bomb that Jesus drops on the end of it. He says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So what Jesus is doing is he's saying, listen, guys, you want a basic, you want to give me an answer of, on, on basic uh, religion, basic belief in God, I'm going to give you a basic answer. And so he gives them the greatest commandment. First and foremost, he says, you got to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then secondly, you need to love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, on the, the bomb on that is he says, everything else, whether you believe it's the Sabbath, whether you believe it's the sacrifice, whatever was important to you, he says to them, he says, whatever is important to you, on everything else hangs these two things is to love God and to love people. And Jesus, what he was doing in Matthew, the 22nd chapter, is essentially Jesus was quoting the Old Testament. So now if you have your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Deuteronomy in the 6th chapter. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy in the 6th chapter. And here, to give you a little bit of background, Jesus Christ is quoting out of Deuteronomy. If you, if you were reading in your Bible, maybe you saw a, a little uh, italicized letter or something of that nature in, in Matthew. What that was basically, it referred you back to Deuteronomy 6, chapter 5, which is where Jesus Christ is, is quoting. And, and here in Deuteronomy, we pick up, and the, the children of Israel have been wandering through the desert for 40 years, and now they come to the, to the borders of the promised land. And at their, as they're at the borders of the promised land, Moses delivers to them three sermons. And basically, he recounts the law 
to them. Or he, recounts their, um, he recounts their sufferings and he recounts their journeys of the 40 years of wandering and the faithfulness of God while they were wandering. He brings to them the importance of why they should ally and always um, focus and always seek after God. And then the third part or the third sermon he brings is to say, you know what? Someday down the line, as he begins to speak of it, he says, someday down the line, you're going to turn away from God. You're going to fall away from the God. And you're going to go into captive lands. But watch the faithfulness of God and trust that if you turn your ways back, if you turn yourself from the old ways back to God, God will be faithful to you. So Moses here before the children even enter into the promised land is already telling them, listen, this is what's going to happen. But you trust in God. You believe in God. And you trust that God is faithful to the people in which his promises are. And so he's teaching this, them this message in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. We'll pick up in the fourth verse. This is basically where Jesus was coming from. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your, t to your children. So hold on for a second. Now we, we read that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He says that this is a command. This is important. But he doesn't just say that as a statement. Hey, listen, guys. Love God. He brought you to the promised land. You really ought to love him. He goes on to say, you should teach them diligently to your children. This commandment, this ideal, this thought of loving God, loving uh, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, is not something just for you to walk into the promised land and to forget when times are good. Now all of a sudden you come to the borders of your promised land, and now all of a sudden when things are good in your life, you love God but rather to teach them diligently to make a solid and resolve effort to pass this concept, to pass this precept, to pass this command from generation to generation because times will not always be good. They won't always be bad. But you need to learn how to love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind when times are good, when you're entering into the promised land and when times are bad, when you're being removed out of your promised land. And he says, teach this command to your children diligently. So he goes on to say, you shall teach this diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. You shall talk of them. So he doesn't just leave it at, hey, listen, pass this idea down to generation to generation. He says this, is so, this should so be on the forefront of your mind. This is, should so be on the forefront of your heart as a, as a follower of God, as somebody who has been delivered out of the bondages and out of the captivities of the previous life to the children of Israel. It was, it was slavery in Egypt to you and I. It was the bondage of sin and death. And he says, now it should be so much on the forefront of your mind that you should speak of it whenever you sit at the table. That this should be the subject of your conversations. It should not be something that comes up out of secrecy. It shouldn't be something that you should keep quiet, but rather go and speak about it. Go and talk about it. And so he says, you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Basically, in every actions of your lifestyle, whether you're coming out of your house, whether you're going back into your house, whether you're walking, whether you're sleeping, whether you're rising, the forefront of God on your mind should be on your mind at every point in your life. Why? Because he's saying, listen, this is a priority. This is not just some words that says you should love God. He's saying this is, should be so important to each and every one of you that no matter what you're doing, doesn't matter if you're working, it doesn't matter if you're at the job and you're sweeping the floor, it doesn't matter if you're driving on the freeway and you're stunk and stuck in bumps bumper to bumper traffic, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, this should be on the forefront of your mind. What is that? To love your God. He doesn't stop there in verse number 8. He goes on and he says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. You know, I think of it like this. Uh, I remember, I, I don't think it's very effective, but I remember there used to be a, a tradition where somebody would tie a string around their finger if they needed to rem remember something. You remember that? I don't, I don't see people do that as much anymore, but, you know, you would say, oh, this, this string, when I would look at that string, I'd say, why is that string on my finger? And you remember, oh, I tied it on my finger because of this. And what he's saying is basically you ought to tie this to your hand. You ought to bind this to yourself so that it doesn't matter if you forget. doesn't matter when the times are good. doesn't matter if the times are bad. Wherever you go, you look down and say, what is that string on my finger? Oh, yeah, it's because I'm supposed to love my Lord, my God, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. Everything we do, you should remember. I mean, you see that Moses is driving this home. He says, 
You shall bind them as a sign in your hand. There shall be frontlets between your eyes. Basically, put that sucker on your forehead so that when you look out, you know, you see the little thing in your nose. You see, that reminds you of God, that God is on the throne, that God is above all, that God had led you out of your previous life, out of your previous self, and now God is, is, is ahead. God is seated above all things. There is nothing above him. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the alpha. He is the omega. And therefore, you should love him with everything that you have. So he goes on to say, it shall be a frontlet between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You know, everywhere you do, everything you do, every staple of your life, Moses says, let it be a reminder to you that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, whatever the translation says at that point. Because God is worthy of our love. God is deserving of our love whether we feel like he is or not. Yes, amen. So based on that, based on what we just talked about. We can't just say that we should love God because that's just a blanket statement. Love God. Church, love God. Okay, message over, let's all go home. No. We got to go deeper than that. We have to understand about love. And you know, what I'm going to do, I'm not going to talk about, you know, the obvious tonight would be to say to what is to love God? To love God with all your heart, with all your mind, to all your soul and to talk about each one of those, your body, soul, your spirit. But tonight I feel like before we can even getting to even before we can even get into the meat of that, we have to understand what the look of love is for us as people towards God. Before we can even understand what, to, what it means to love God in our body, in our mind, in our spirit, with all our strength, with all our power, we have to understand what it means, what it looks like to love God. You know, as people, we only understand life. We only understand teachings. We only understand the things that we have been told, the things that we read through the perception of our own experiences. Does that make sense to you? Somebody might deliver a concept to you and you may, oh, I don't get it. I don't understand what they're talking about. So maybe like Jesus, they would tell a story. And all of a sudden the story would make sense because you could relate to that story. So here, God, throughout the Bible, we see uh, the love between uh, God and his people as a father and a children. Throughout the New Testament, we see the love of Jesus Christ as a husband to a wife. Why? Because these are examples that we know. See, we don't understand in our mindset the idea of un unwavering love, of agape love, of, of love that holds no boundaries because we are finite people. We are ruled, we are determined, we have, been ex we have experienced emotions and they drive us. Yet God is beyond our realm. God is not limited by his emotions. God is not limited by time. God is not limited by the knowledge or the experience of his knowledge. God knows all. God created all. God started all. He was there before all. He'll be there after all. So all of a sudden we have got to understand that when we speak to love of God, we can only understand love based on our ideas. Although God hasn't called for us to rise up. And to, to, to rise to his level of understanding with love. So what I want to do tonight is I want to look at some of these different areas of a, of a loving relationship, a, lo a relationship in love. Whether it be a husband and wife. You say, Pastor Luke, I'm not married. Well, if you've ever uh, been married or if you've ever dated or you are dating, then you can understand the relationship between a man and a woman. Maybe you don't, you're not there. Maybe a son to a father or a father to a son or brother to a sister. So forth and so on. Each and every one of us have had the ability, had the opportunity at some capacity, whether it be great or small, diminished or, or grandeur, to, to live a life of, of, a, of relationship and love. And they, it may not be exemplary, but we can still understand through the perception of our life and our experiences uh, the, the look and the ideas of love. So tonight what I want to do is I've got five things to talk to you about, about the, to love God. And so basically what I want to do tonight is I want to take the statement to love God and then is and then give you the point. So if you're taking notes, you can just write to love God and then is. But so each of the points won't say to love God, it'll just say is. But you'll understand that pre the, the, pre the preceding before each point is to love God. So what we're going to talk about tonight is, is to look at, 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 at love. You know, what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to show you some points. And these are, these are action based. These are things that, you know, are, are determined by our actions, determined by what we say, by how we act, by how we live. But let me tell you something. As you know, in a loving relationship, you know, they say actions are louder than words. That's why I wanted to point out actions because actions oftentimes come from the inside. But listen, 
If you've ever been in a loving relationship, if you've ever been in a relationship, maybe you've been in a husband or, you know, with your wife or your husband or your, or your kids, sometimes your actions are not based on how you feel inside. Your actions are just based on because you know that's what's best for the relationship at this time. So I want to emphasize the danger in just focusing in actions because a relationship to love your God is not solely based upon actions. If you base your love on God solely upon the actions of your life, solely upon the words that you speak, then what you're doing is you're stepping into legalism. The, the, to love your God is not just based upon your actions, but rather more so to, to be in your heart. It's a, an expression of the inward that it bleeds to the outside. And from the inside, you begin to reflect how you feel about God. And that, that in turn comes from the outside. So I don't want to just say that if you go through these five things that we're going to talk about today, that that's a sign that you love God. Those are a sign that you're acting as if you love God. But the truth comes from within. The truth comes from a heart. Just like any relationship... You can't just, if it's just actions, if it's just based on the external, yet there's no internal connection in that relationship, you know that relationship's doomed to fail because there has to be something more than just interaction between two people. There has to be a connection. And God has designed each and every one of us to have an intimate connection with him from the inside. And as that connection grows, so does the actions and the outside Connection. So do you understand that? Did I make myself clear on that? Because I don't want to just say that this is based on your actions. So are we clear on that tonight? Yes. Praise God. So why don't we get into the message tonight? We're talking about to love God. Number one, to love God is to honor God. I like to think of it like this, to acknowledge him. You know, as a husband and wife, let me see, Pastor Luke, I can't relate to that. I'm not married. Well, if you've ever dated it's probably even more so than this because the more you get married, the, the less the endearing terms become uh, uh, something special but more of, of, of habit or of, of just nicknames. But as a husband and wife, they acknowledge each other. You know, uh, my, my, my beautiful wife, I, I don't always call her Stacy. I don't call her wife. A lot of times I call her babe call her mama, I call her girl, I call her honey, I call her bubba. I don't know why I call her bubba. But you know what the thing is, is that, I know Bubba's like, <laughs> I don't know. The thing about it is, is that I don't speak to my wife the same that I speak to my friends. I don't go out to public, I don't come to work and speak to people on the same level that I speak to my wife. You know, Stacy is my best friend. Stacy is the person that I share everything with. We talk about everything. And there's an acknowledgement there between a husband and wife, between, you know, a, a boyfriend and a girlfriend or a fiance and, a, and whatever it might be. Think of it like this. You could probably relate to this. I've been there before when maybe uh, when Stacy's called me and I've been around the guys and we're out hiking, we're out sweating, doing whatever it is we're doing. And she wants to talk all lovey-dovey. Oh, baby, I love you. And you're over there in the corner like, you know, I love you too, baby. <laughs> you don't want nobody else to hear you because you treat her differently than you treat people, other people. You see what I'm saying? And there's an acknowledgement there. There's a reaffirmation in our relationship that says, hey, listen, you're special to me. You're not just some Joe Smo. I don't introduce my wife as my friend as I'm walking around somewhere and say, hey, I want to introduce somebody. This is my friend Stacy. No, no. I will get in a lot of trouble. And so to honor God, to acknowledge God, to love God is to honor him. And a lot of times what that means is that means to acknowledge him, to acknowledge that God is God, to acknowledge that God is not just something up in the sky, some name that we've given to, to, to things that we can't describe, something that we just, we, we put everything that science doesn't quite make sense of yet, and we call it an act of God because we can't figure it out. God wants acknowledgement for who he is. God deserves the honor of who he is. He says, listen guys, in a loving relationship, I need more than just a title of God. I need to be something honored in your life. I need to be something that you place value on. I need to be something that you treat as special. Are you guys with me? To love God is to honor God. You know, I love what the psalmist says in Psalms 29. I'm going to jump all throughout Psalms, so I'll just go ahead and pop that up on the overhead. In Psalms 29, I think, I think he says it pretty much just the way we need to say it is, Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. 
Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. You see, God, regardless of how we feel about him, God, regardless of what we think in our minds, God, regardless of our understandings of him, is due glory. You say, well, Pastor Luke, I don't know. What has God done for me? What has God done for people? I feel like God is this little kid up on an anthill with a glass trying to, trying to burn me, it feels like. But understand this. We'll get to this in, in the second and latter part of this verse as well, that God is more than just the man upstairs, guys. God is the creator of the universe. God holds everything together in his hands. I love the humbling statement that as Job begins to, uh, to d describe his feelings to God and God responds to Job, he says, okay, you've had your chance, now let me speak. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I unrolled the universe? <laughs> Hello, okay, kind of put me into my place right there. We think that life is grand. We think that we know everything about it because, again, we base life on our own understanding based on our own perceptions. But all of a sudden, God says, you know what? It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter how, you know, the distractions that you're feeling uh, at this very moment. It doesn't matter if you're in, in walking into your promised land, like Moses said, or you're being taken out of your promised land. He says, God is due the glory to his name. Why? Because he is God. There is no other before him. There is none after him. He is God. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. You know, I said that God's not just a filler word. We like to say that, oh, it's an act of God. We, 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 because of our, the limited mind, uh, the, our limited mindsets, because of our limited knowledge, we try to prove God or disprove God through science. And so whatever we can grab a hold of that's supernatural, whatever we can grab a hold of that can't quite be explained by mathematics or numbers, we say, oh, that, that must be of God. But it's so much more than that. God is so much beyond a, a, a title. He's so much beyond a name. God is real. God is living. And God is for you and I. And we have got to understand this. Psalms 145, the psalmist says, I will meditate. I will meditate. Listen, I will meditate means meditate. It doesn't mean that. You know what? Okay, I'll give it a token thought here and again. I will meditate means I'm going to devote some serious time. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, speaking to God, and on your wondrous works. God's desire for you and I is to remember that he is the creator. When was the last time we even just looked at the glory of the mountains in our backyard and said, holy cow, where did those come from? The rivers the, that carved through over millions of years in our planet. And to say, wow, that was through the hand of God. Science tries to say it was this. Science tries to say it was that. That's fine. That's great. Wonderful. It's been proven wonderful. But God is at the root of that because of his marvelous and glorious splendor. Church, it is for you and I. It is God's desire for you and I. Remember, as Moses said, as you're coming, as you're going, as you're waking up, as you're lying down, to meditate, to think upon the honoring of God and to give him the glory in which he is due. And in doing so, you reflect your love for him. Why? Because you're dedicating time. You're dedicating priority, precedence to giving God thought in your mind because you know whatever it is in life life derails our thoughts everything is fighting for priority in our lives whether it's our jobs whether it's our families whether it's our children our, our friends our hobbies whatever it is everything wants a moment of your time yet when you begin to give God the glory and the honor and like the psalmist says to meditate on his splendor now all of a sudden what you're doing is say, you know what I'm going to take a moment to show that God is priority. God is important. God deserves my thoughts, my attention, and my honor. Are you with me tonight? We're talking about to love God. Speaking of loving God. To love God, number two, is to revere, and in parentheses, and fear God. You know, revere means to hold something dear. To, to put something in a special place in your heart. I, I revere this, this book, you know, uh, uh, the, I revere this, I love it. It's, it's great, I, I, it's just special to me. Out of that word revere, we get the word reverence, which takes it a step further. And revere means, you know what, I'll hold it special. That's good, that's wonderful. But now reverence coming from revere says to not just hold it special, but to hold a deep respect for something. No longer does now God have just, uh, oh, he's special in my life, but now all of a sudden, a deep respect for something in my life. And then to take it a step further, as we read in the Bible, to fear God, to understand that God is more than just a name. 
God is more than just the imaginary man upstairs. That God is real. God is existent. God is alive. And God is powerful. And to understand, to have a healthy fear, to have a healthy reverence for our God as a sign of affection. You know, my dad's sitting here on the front row, and as a, as a, as a young man and as, as a son, I revere my dad. There's some, there's some times, there's some moments in, in our history and in our past where we just laugh about some of the things, you know, and I hold some, I hold some times near and dear to my heart, and it doesn't matter. Well, after dad's long and gone, uh, when that day comes, I'll always remember those moments and those times because I revere those, I hold those special. But then to take it a step further, as my father and as his son, I also reverence my dad. And to say I hold a deep level of respect for him because he's my father. And, when, and because of his age, because of his, his uh, experience, when he says, hey, listen, I'm going to tell you something. He always says, I'm going to tell you something, Luke, and you should listen to this. Right then I know, I'm going to listen. Because I know he's experienced it. He's gone through these things. And he was, all he's doing is as a father, he's trying to impart to me things that will make me a better person, that will make me a stronger person. So I have a reverence for him. Now, I have a unique relationship with my father in the sense that he's also my pastor and my employer. Therefore, I have a fear for my dad. <laughs> now, I won't say that it's a trembling and a quaking fear. Maybe as a child I can say that it was. But what that means is a fear means, you know what, I'm not going to come in and I'm not going to yell at him as if he's some servant of mine, as he's just something that I treat as common. Why? Because he's my pastor, so he's my spiritual head. What he says, as it comes from God, hey, listen, I need to listen to, I need to understand. So I have a fear for it, as well as the employer. He's the one that's, his name's on my paycheck. And so if I'm going to come in and I'm going to try to do things my way and say, hey, listen, I don't care what you say, I will quickly understand why I should have had fear. Yet so often we see God through our own mindset. Oh, I like to just see God as this loving father that, that you know, all he ever wants is good and good and good. And that there's, there's the, you know, the, that God isn't, he's just a loving, wonderful pushover God. Come on, guys, let's be a little bit realistic here. Our God is a mighty God. Yes. Our God is the beginning and the end. And now our God loves us. Our loves us enough to, to the point where he gave his only begotten son to die for us so that you and I could be connected to him. Like a father who wants his son to succeed, God did everything he could for us to succeed. But also like a father, he can be tough on his son. He could be tough on his kids. Why? Because oftentimes we in our lives need correction. We in our lives need hard learning. It's just the way things go. Yet oftentimes when, when times get tough, when God gets a little hard on us, we say, oh, God, you're being mean to me. But really, we have to understand that God deserves the fear and the respect and the reverence and that deep holding of respect in our lives. Are you with me? Jesus Christ, I mean, God, you want to drive it home. Here, Jesus Christ in Luke, the 12th chapter, says, hey, listen, don't be afraid of the guy that can just kill you, and then when you're done, that's it, okay? <laughs> Oof. You want to see a drive home? Luke 12, chapter 5, he says, But I'll show you who you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed you, has power to cast you into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Guys, let me tell you something. God, we have a, we have a billboard. Man, I'll tell you what. This billboard says it all right there. It says, stop messing with God and get to the rock church. We thought of that long and hard. Why? Because God is not something for you and I to mess with. We're not there to try to push God to the limits to see, well, how far to the edge can I get before God leaves me alone? Because he says, listen, you want to know who to fear? Fear the person that can not only remove you from this existence, but also after you've been removed, if you are not connected to him, if you don't believe in the son Jesus Christ, if you've been messing with him, guess where you're going? And there's a healthy understanding behind some fear of God to say, you know what? God is not something for you and I to be messing with. God is not something for you and I to be testing with. God is not something for you and I to treat as a casual, but rather to understand that God is righteous. God is above all, and God is a righteous judge. And when God's judgment comes down, let me tell you something, his judgment is final. There is no appeals process to God's judgment. 
So we need to have a healthy fear. And when you keep the fear of God in your life, when you have a reverence for God in your life, let me tell you something, talking about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. When you fear God, you know what I'll tell you what? The fear of God keeps you in line. Just as a child, as when I remember when I was growing up, man, my dad, he, he, you know what? He didn't hold the rod back from us as, as me and my sister. He wasn't overly exertive on it, and he always explained why he did what he did. But let me tell you something. There were certain things in my life that I stopped doing for fear of the rod, for fear of correction. And the fear of God will keep us on the path of righteousness and the path of loving our God. Are you with me? Psalms 89, verse 7. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. Sometimes we forget that God, while he loves us, he is final. That is, there is no, there is no Supreme Court. It doesn't matter what the Supreme Court says. God's judgment, God's righteousness is final. That's the stopping point. And what do we base ourselves on? The respect of the world and the laws and the legal systems or the fear of God to say, hey, you know what? Listen, man, I don't care what's going on around me. What my God says, I, I, I respect him. I, re I reverence him. I hold him in a deep enough respect to listen to what he says, to do what he says, continuing on. We're talking about to love God. Number three, speaking of reverencing and respecting and doing what he says, to love God is to submit to God. As an endearment, we should know that while we honor God, we should know that we fear him. And when we understand if God says something, hello, we should do it. You know, the word submit means to come other, under. You know, Pastor Debbie's always taught us that the word submit comes from the Greek meaning sub, messio, sub meaning under, messio meaning mission. So you come under the mission. And you and I have to submit to, to reduce ourselves down to allow God to be the leader of our life. Amen. You know what's interesting is that we submit to all sorts of things. And we say, well, well, Pastor Luke, you know, it's, it's tough for me to submit because God's told me to go and do this. Or God's told me to, to reach out and do that. Or God's told me to trust him in this. But it's just so hard for me. It's just so tough for me to step out and do it. You know what's interesting, though, is that we don't have a hard time uh, to taking risks in the stock market to, to, to invest or to put ourselves out in the real estate market or in the business venture or in our friends, in our families, or in our lives based on forecasts, based on advice, based on recommendations from experts, yet when the, the, the ruler of the universe, the maker of all things, the, the king of kings, the lord of lords says, hey, I want you to do this, we have a hard time grabbing a hold of that. Yeah. Something's wrong. Something's missing. When you know it, okay, I can, oh, but Pastor Luke, it's just my money. You know, if, if I invest it into the stock market or if I put it in the house, oh, I lose it, I go belly up. You know what? I still am alive. What's the difference whether you're alive with a lot or you're alive with a little? You come into this world with nothing, you leave this world with nothing. What matters is where you go after. So we put all of our focus and all of our emphasis on today. On, 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 oh, it's okay because it's just material things. But God says, I don't care about the material things. I care about your soul. Yeah. And for us to learn to submit, to come under the mission of God, to say, you know what, God says, listen, I have plans. I have thoughts for you. I know the calling I have for your life. And if you would just listen to my word, if you would just heed my word, if you, if you hear what I say and you go and do it, trust that I will be with you. And we would learn to submit to God. And you know what? By submitting, we say, you know what, God? I reduce myself. I reduce my pride. I reduce my, my, my reliance on my own self. And I increase it to you. And I give my attention. And I give my knowledge. And I give my understanding to you. I love that the Bible says to be still and know that he is God. Why? Because, listen, it doesn't matter what recommendations are for the stock market. It doesn't matter what forecasts are for the real estate market. It doesn't matter about our money. It doesn't matter about our relationship. What matters is us, our relationship between us and God and where we go and what we do with our life and the legacy that we leave behind because God has given each and every one of us a calling. All we have to do is submit and to follow what God has for us. Are you with me? I'm preaching more than you're clapping. Psalm 63, one of my favorite psalms. 
I remember as I was in university, my Christian studies teacher made us recite this in front of all the class. And, and I just thought about this, this Psalm 63 and instantly just popped up into my head. Oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and a thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and glory. The psalmist goes on to say, I will meditate upon you in my night watches. I will think about you. But I love what he says in verse number one. Put verse number one back up on the overhead if you can, guys. Oh, God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. Early I will seek you. What is that saying? You know what? What you do early in the morning, that says priority. Because, hey, listen, I don't know about you. Some of you people are morning people. You wake up and you're just chipper, okay? Not me. It takes me a good little while to get moving and to get rolling. And so whatever I do first in the morning, that really says that there's priority. Because I don't want to do anything in the morning. I, it's hard for me to even think. It's hard for me to communicate. My son's crying. We're trying to change his diaper. I'm trying to make sure that I tell my wife I love her and not snarl at her because I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. What you do early says, hey, this is a priority because you do it first. And the psalmist says, oh, God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. He goes on to say, I have thirsted for you. Like, a, like in a land where there is no, in a dry and weary land where there is no water. The psalmist paints a picture for us in a desert place where there is no water. Your mouth is, mm, mm, all you want is a drop of water. He says, that's how much we should desire after God, to seek after God, to follow after God. Amen. Why? Because we have to submit to God. You with me? Yeah. To love God is to seek God, number four. You know, a love relationship doesn't last if it's not pursued. My wife is amazing. And I am an introverted type of person. If you know me personally, then you know that even though I'm up here talking in, 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 with, with a group of people, I'm very quiet. My family would say, I'm very quiet. They're always asking me, what's wrong? What's wrong? I just don't talk. And my wife oftentimes has to kind of remind me, kick me as a husband. You need to pursue me a little bit. I'm like, oh, man, you know, because we get complacent in our lives. And so number four today is we've got to seek God. To love God is to seek God. Why? Because we have to pursue God. My father's always said, what you treat as common will become common. And as, as a husband and a wife, if that husband does not pursue the wife, if that wife does not pursue the husband, the relationship deviates and they go their own ways. And soon enough, there's a chasm, there's a gap between them. And all of a sudden we look back and we say, what happened to our relationship? And we wonder, why is it that we seem distant to God? Why? Because we haven't pursued him. Yeah. You with me? We have not sought after God. We have not placed a priority on God. We have not said, God, you are the most important thing. It doesn't matter about my job. It doesn't matter about my family. It doesn't matter about my children. Any of that stuff, you say, whoa, wait a minute, my children? Hey, let me tell you something. God is number one. Why? Because it doesn't matter your legacy of your kids. When you go, you respond to God, not your kids. And that you're, you, because you love God, you ought to exemplify your relationship with God and your pursuit of God to your children so that they can see what it is, a loving and healthy relationship according to God. I'll tell you what, one of the examples that my parents has always given us is a good and healthy pursuit of God. As a child, my parents would always tell us, I wanted to play sports and we wanted to do things, and my dad would always say, you know what, you can play sports as long as it's not on Sunday. I don't know if you've ever tried to play sports. They're all on Sunday. And, you know, and then we, be, and then I remember I was on the high school hockey team. And, um, <laughs> right, Southern California high school hockey team. Anyways. <laughs> I remember I got on the team and all of a sudden we started having Wednesday night services. And dad said, well, yeah, you, yeah, you can do sports. That's great. But you can't go to practices on Wednesday nights because we have church and God's more important. And I remember looking back at it, just being bitter. Oh, nah, nah, nah. You know, the bottom line is now I look back and say, you know what? My father was setting a point in my life. 
And he was saying, as a leader, I'm going to pursue God because as Dan, Pastor Dan preached this morning, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Why? Because I'm going to seek after God because it doesn't matter about sports. It doesn't matter about soccer. It doesn't matter about going to the river on Sundays. It doesn't matter about what you do on the weekend at all, but it's my days off. Let me tell you something. God is more important than your days off, but you ought to seek God more than just on your days off. God has to be given priority. We cannot treat God as common. Early I will seek you, the psalmist says. My soul thirsts and longs for you, like we were just reading. In James, the fourth chapter, verse number eight. I always pray this when I pray before a service. Uh, here the, James is saying, listen, you know what? When you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. You know what? God has pursued you. God has, has done everything he can for you to be connected with him to the point he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on a cross for you and I. He's already pursued you. He's there waiting. So we have only, again, through our perception, we think that, oh, well, God, he, he's turning his back on me because you don't, you don't know what I've been through, Pastor Luke. You don't know the things that I've committed. We can only understand that based on our own relationships. We don't understand that God said, listen, I love you. It doesn't matter what you've done. I'm here. All you got to do is pursue me. All you got to do is draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. You put in, I put in. And God says, listen, I'll tell you what. You'll be blessed in doing so. Are you with me? Yeah. Romans 3.23 says, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter what you've done. God knows that. The Bible says that in, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He knows what you and I have done. We have to pursue him and understand that he is there with loving and open arms. Last for tonight, to love God is to represent God. To love God is to represent God. As a wife marries her husband, typically she takes his last name. This is the 21st century. There's a lot of hyphenations and a lot of abbreviations and, and things of that nature. I remember when Dan and Jess got married, we tried so hard to convince Dan to take her name. <laughs> but he was a strong and willing husband. He said, no, nope, my name. But as, as a wife marries her husband, she typically takes his name. Why? Because they become a family. You and I are the bride of Christ, the church. We have taken on God's name. It doesn't matter what your last name is. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter your lineage. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. Now you represent the name of God. Just like the, the children of Israel, the people of Israel, God said, I will be with you. Why? So that people will know that I am God. God says, you represent me so people will know that I am God. And you and I are the representation of God. So we have got to represent God in a manner that reflects positively upon that. Why? Because of our love for him. You kind of catching where I'm going with that? You see what I'm saying? In John, the 15th chapter... Man, I'll tell you what, John, the 15th chapter is just, ugh, man, you, you just want to read a, read a chapter one day, read John 15. It'll blow your mind. John 15, chapter 8, by this, 15, 8, Jesus Christ, as he says to, to his disciples, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. You know, I remember I was telling this a, a couple weeks ago when I was here last, uh, and we were talking about John 15, chapter, fruit is the DNA of that tree. You can tell it's a grapefruit tree because of the grapefruit. You can tell it's a, a grapevine because of the grapes. You can tell it's an apple tree because of the apples. So when you and I as, as members of the vine or members of the family of Jesus Christ bear fruit, we are showing the DNA of who we are. We are giving the outward appearance of what is happening on the inside, the, the, the blood work, the, the, the redemption, the blood of Jesus Christ that now flows through us because we are adopted into the family. Now we are showing who we are by bearing much fruit, representing God. And he says, that by this, that my Father would be glorified, that we would be good representatives of God. Why? That we would bear much fruit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20 says, You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know, as a child is to their parent, <laughs> as you, if you're, Bjorn is mine, man. He belongs to me. He's not property, but he's mine. God owns you and I. 
We were bought with a price, the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. We belong to God. Going back, I didn't even plan for any of these illustrations. They just keep popping up. As a child, whenever I would go anywhere, my mom would always tell me, you say, yes, ma'am, no, sir. You say, please, and you say, thank you. She would, every time I would go to a friend's house, every time I would spend the night, why? Because as a child, as the last name, Cobra, I represented them. And if I misbehaved, if I was in school and I got detention from doing something, let me tell you something. That was a reflection upon their parenting, and they were displeased on that bad behavior. So my mom and my dad would always teach me as a kid, you be respectful to people. You know, back in the old days, they don't say this anymore, but they used to say, children should be seen and not heard. Because I was a representation of my family. And because of the love of I had, that I had for my family, because of the fear and the reverence and the respect I had for my parents, I did what I could to represent them right. So it's church, it's our ideal, it's our calling, it's our position in loving God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with our mind to represent God in a manner that glorifies him, that lifts him up, that brings him to a place that people around say, hey, there's something about you, what is it? And you say, it's God. Because we represent him. In conclusion today, to love God is to honor God. To love God is to revere and fear God. To love God is to submit to God. To love God is to seek God. To love God is to submit, or is to uh, represent God. You guys get anything out of that tonight? We praise God. I want to ask you a question tonight. You know, it'd be a shame for us to come into the house of the Lord and to hear the praise and worship and to, 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 to sing some songs into God, to, to hear some message, to hear a message about God, to clap and do all of that and have a good time and to, to not give you the opportunity to examine yourself and to see whether or not you're going to go to heaven or whether you're going to go to hell based on your response. So let me ask you a question. I want you to answer it within your heart. If you were to leave this place tonight and you were to die, heaven forbid, I hope that's not the case, but if you were to leave this place tonight and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a relatively simple question, but why don't we go over some of your answers that you may have had? You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I'm not sure I believe that heaven or hell exists. I just, I don't know where I stand on the matter yet. Can I, can I tell you something? Just because you don't believe or you're not sure that heaven or hell are real doesn't mean that heaven or hell isn't real. It's like saying this. You know, it's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks and going and standing on the slow lane of the freeway hoping that nothing ever comes my way. But lo and behold, if I go and stand in the slow lane of the freeway, guess what? I'm going to meet one face to face. Just because you believe that hell doesn't exist, maybe because you don't know or you're not sure, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Hell is a very real place. As a matter of fact, God thought it important enough to mention in his word. Jesus Christ thought it important enough to teach about it in his teachings. Therefore, it's important enough for you and I to take it serious and to understand that it is very real. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I think I'm going to get to heaven. I hope so. I really want to go. Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you think that you're going to get to heaven, because you hope you're going to get to heaven, because you desire to get to heaven, you really want to get there, that you're going to find your way into heaven. Can you show me where it says that? Like you have the most positive outlook on life means that you're going to find your way into heaven. Nowhere in the Word of God will you find that. Well, you know, you might even say, well, Pastor Luke, you know what? Uh, I wasn't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, as a Catholic, or a Muslim, or any other type of world religion. So doesn't that kind of by default mean that I'm going to go to heaven? Can you show me where it says it because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, a Hindu, a Muslim, or anything else that you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere in the Bible. Just because you profess to be a Christian, because your parents took you to church on Christmas and on Easter. Maybe you went to Sunday school, Sabbath school, or catechism classes as a kid. And you say, you know what? Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says it? Because your parents took you to church on Christmas and on Easter. Because you attended Sunday school, Sabbath school, catechism classes. Maybe even as a child you were baptized or christened. Does, can you show me in the word of God where it says that that's going to get you into heaven? Nowhere in the Bible... Will you find that because somebody gave you a title, because somebody sat you in a service during once or twice a year, because somebody blew smoke and water over you, are you going to get into heaven? Guys, listen, I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough to tell you the truth, to quit playing games, and to tell you like it really is. It's just not the way. Well, but Pastor Luke, you know, I'm a good person. I don't cheat on my taxes. I, I've never robbed a 7-Eleven. I, I do more good in my life than I do bad. I even give or have given to charitable organizations. I've, I've helped fight world hunger. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get to heaven? Surely God wouldn't send good people to hell. 
Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you're a good person, because you don't cheat on your taxes, because you've never robbed the 7-Eleven, because you do more good in your life than bad, means that you're going to get into heaven. Can you show me based on the Word of God where it says that? Nowhere in the Word will you find that. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God, are like filthy rags. Nothing we could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. It's just not that way. Yet so many people, especially in America, believe that if you're good enough, you're going to get into heaven. I don't know where we got that thought, but I hear, I'm, lo I hear, I'm here to tell you the truth, to love you enough, to quit playing games with you, and to tell you the honest truth. It's just not that way. Well, but, but Pastor Luke, you know what? I'm, I'm a spiritual person. I believe that, that God exists. I believe in, 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 in the spiritual realm, but I just want to kind of keep an open mind as, to far as, as far as I'm not sure where I land on that. Just because you say you're a spiritual person, because you believe that there's a spiritual realm, because you can't quite land on where it is, but you don't want to deny that God exists, just because you claim to be spiritual doesn't mean that you're going to get to heaven. Can you show me where it says that because you believe in God? Because, because you know about God. Because you might even know the stories of Moses and of Jonah and Abraham and, and Jesus. Doesn't mean that you're going to get into heaven. Can you show me where it says any of that in the Bible? Because of your knowledge of the word of God. Because you're a spiritual person. Because you're an enlightened person. Nowhere will you find that. Well, but, but Pastor Luke, you know, uh, uh, I love God. Doesn't that, we talked about that today. Doesn't that mean anything? Can you show me where it says that just because you say you love God, you're going to get into heaven. You know what? Some people got in some airplanes, crashed them into the side of the building some 10 years ago. They said, we love you, God. And guess what? Wrong God, wrong kind of love. Just because you say that you love God doesn't mean that it's going to get you into heaven. There's more to it than that, and we'll get into it in just a moment. Well, but, but Pastor Luke, you know, uh, I, I, I was a, a leader in my last church. I carried the pastor's Bible. I've memorized some scripture. I, I could say it's the Sunday school verses. I, I know that. I, I have a card in my wallet that even says that I'm a member to a church. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Doesn't that count for something? Let me tell you something. Uh, in the book of John, a man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus. The Bible tells us that Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews. Because Nicodemus was a Pharisee, that tells us that Nicodemus dedicated his young life to studying, to memorizing after the word of God. Nicodemus knew more scriptures than you and I knew. Nicodemus sang the scriptures. He wore the right clothes. He, he teached in the, in the, in the temple of his, of, his, of his time. You would think that when Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, Jesus... What must I do to get into heaven that Jesus would look to Nicodemus based on all of that and say, you know what, man, Nicodemus, pat on the back, dude. You just keep on going. Great is your reward. But Jesus says to Nicodemus, you know what, Nicodemus? You must be born again. Well, what does born again mean? You know, Hollywood, popular culture, society has made a mockery out of that term. You think of radical, crazy, out of control, weirdo Christianity. But let me tell you something. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. Everybody look at me, look at me, look at me. God's not after your mental ascent towards him. He's not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. The Bible says that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God is, yet they're not finding their way to heaven, so there must be more to be born again, to give him all of your heart, to give him all of your life. God is after a personal relationship with each and every one of us. You know, Jesus Christ speaking to the, to the church in the book of Revelation says, Hey, listen, when I come back, I know your deeds. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Oh, those are harsh words. What Jesus Christ is saying is, listen, when I come back, when it comes time to meet me face to face, he says, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. I better find you in or I better find you out. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will cast you out. I will spit you out of the kingdom of God. But well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me tell you what lukewarm means. Lukewarm means this. It means that you've been a little bit up, you've been a little bit down, you've been a little bit in, and you've been a little bit out in your relationship with God. Occasional church attendance, maybe here and again. Maybe you throw a token prayer out here and once in a while. you got a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. You've been doing your own thing. You've been doing some of God's thing. you got too much of God in you to enjoy the world. you got too much of the world in you to enjoy God. You're riding the fence. Jesus Christ says, hey, listen, man, if that's you, if, you, if I come back and I find you in that position, you're deceived in thinking you're going to make it into the kingdom of God. You say, Pastor Luke, I appreciate the effort that you're going through. You find God your way. I'll find God my way. We'll all get there the same. Let me tell you something. Let's not do it your way today. Let's not do it my way today. Let's do it God's way. In this house, what I'm going to do, Jesus Christ says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except through him. 
So you know what? Let's not do it your way. Let's not do it my way tonight. Let's do it God's way in this house. And what he says is, you know what? If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, Jesus says, I'll deny you before my Father. So here's what I'm going to do. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three. I'm going to go bang. I'm going to smack my hand on this Bible. If that's you, if you've never given all of your heart, you've never given all of your heart life to Jesus Christ. If you're not sure, in a moment, I want to give you the opportunity to make sure. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, in a moment, I want to give you the opportunity. When I smack my hand on the Bible, bang, I want you to pop your hand up. All at the same time, we'll do it together. What you're doing when you pop your hand up is you know what you're saying? I'll, I acknowledge that I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I want to give all of my heart. I want to give all of my life to God. You know, God's not a conniver. He's not a manipulator. He's not going to force his way in. He's not going to make his way in. God has done everything he can to connect you to him by giving his son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess on the cross for you and I. So therefore, God has done everything he can. Now it's between you and I whether or not we want to receive and accept Jesus Christ into our heart, into our life. You say, Pastor Luke, you know what? If I raise my hand, I might be embarrassed. You know what, I'm not going to embarrass you, but even if you were embarrassed because you put your hand up in the church, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? The decision is yours. God requires all of your heart, all of your life. He's given you his everything, and he wants your everything. All across this auditorium, all at the same time, if you've never given all your heart, all your life to Jesus Christ, I encourage you in a moment to put your hand up when I count to three. If you're not sure, the Bible says, hey, you don't know what tomorrow brings. We aren't promised tomorrow. The Bible tells us that our life is but a vapor. So you don't want sure, don't leave this place tonight without making sure. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, riding that fence tonight, let's make it the night that you make sure you get into the kingdom of God and you get hot for God. All across this auditorium, hands are getting ready to go up. If that's you in this place. One, two, three. Go ahead and pop your hands up so I can see you. Gotcha. One, two, three. Three wise people. Where are you at? Three people. If I see four, I got you, sister. You guys can put your hands on if I saw you. I got you guys. Four wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Five, I got you, sister. Five people. Anybody else in this house today? Five wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Say, man, I wonder if I should do this. You should do this. Go ahead and pop your hand up so I can see. And let's move on with your relationship with God starting now. That's you. Five wise people in the house. Anybody else? All across this auditorium. Five people. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. If that's you, go ahead and pop your hand up so I can see it. Put it right back down. Well, praise God for five wise, five wise people. Hallelujah. Praise God. Here's what I want to do. In a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, I want you to be bold. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. And I want you to get out of your chair, get out of your seat and come and meet me. You said you were going to give Jesus Christ all of your heart, all of, all of your life. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking him to come into your heart and come into your life. So let us pray with you. So if that's you, if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, I want you to come and get out of your chair, get out of your seat as we all stand together and come and meet me right up here at the altar today. That's you. If you can come, come on down. If you can come. Lord, I give Come on down. you my heart. Come on down. I'll give you my soul. And I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I Well, hey guys, listen, I want to encourage you. This is a new day. This is a fresh start, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a friend of you, to, a friend of mine to you. This is Pastor Dave. You thought, man, Pastor Luke, you're pretty cool. Uh, that, this guy is where it's at. What he's going to do is he's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by praying a prayer. And it's not some abracadabra magical words that says, oh, okay, now all of a sudden I'm in heaven. It's about the heart. So he's going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to give you some free stuff. Free stuff. Our pastor wrote a book called Welcome to Your, to Your Destiny. Super easy reading. It just says, hey, you know what? Now that you got saved, where do you go from here? He's also going to introduce to you a friend, somebody here at the church that we call spiritual personal tra trainers. You know, if you go to the gym, you see those personal trainers, and they help you build the muscles and make sure you eat the, the spinach and all that stuff and get those muscles real nice and strong. Uh, and they, we're going to introduce to you a friend, a spiritual personal trainer, somebody that will meet with you before service, they get you a cup of coffee, whatever it is, and they'll teach you some things about the Word of God so that you don't go back to the junk that you came from. From, that you get strong in the ways of the Lord. So if you guys would just turn right over there to your left, my right, and go with Pastor Dave.
today.